In 1885, an anxious father of five unmarried daughters wrote a letter to the Pittsburgh Dispatch, desperate for advice. I'm worried how his girls would cope out in the big bad world without men to look after them. Their columnist, Erasmus Wilson, replied in an editorial piece entitled, What Are Girls Good For? According to Wilson, girls were not good for terribly much. In his diatribe, Wilson decried working women as a monstrosity, stating the only place for a woman was in the home. He lambasted parents of working women for allowing them to enter the workforce and suggested America should follow China's two millennia long practice of, well, some parents drowning female babies. If you imagine that even in 1885, such an exhibit of he-man woman-hating misogyny would get some heat, well, you'd be correct. A mountain of letters of complaint to the editor came flooding in. One in particular, an anonymous piece signed Lonely Orphan Girl, stood out for its remarkably direct and persuasive use of language. The letter never got published, but so impressed managing editor George Madden that he wrote an open letter inviting the writer to come and see him. The next day, a 20-year-old woman named Elizabeth Cochran, a former trainee teacher at Indiana Teachers College, who dropped out to help her mother run a boarding house, showed up at the office. Madden offered her a job as a reporter, which she took unhesitatingly. Cochrane took on the nom de plume Nellie Bly, a name she'd borrowed from a minstrel song written by the father of American music, Stephen Foster. Bly wrote for the Pittsburgh Dispatch for seven years, writing mostly on fashion, high society, gardening and the like. But she also covered the lives of working women, the poor of Pittsburgh, and for some time, official corruption and wealth inequality in Mexico. Looking for bigger opportunities, she moved to New York in 1887. That year, she approached Joseph Pulitzer's The New York World, wanting to report on the lives of poor immigrants in the Big Apple. While The New York World was not at all interested in that story, they did have a challenging job for Nellie, if she was up for the task. Infiltrate the remote, secretive, Blackwell Island Insane Asylum, as she would on a number of big challenges in her life. Bly said yes without hesitation. On 22nd September 1887, Nellie Bly came up with a plan to get herself committed with the least amount of collateral damage. Under the guise of a young out-of-towner looking for work, she booked herself into a boarding house for working women and then began to act one part paranoid, one part clinically depressed, one part retrograde amnesiac. She in turns acted mad till the boarding house owners called for two police officers to come and take Nellie away. The police arrived and took her back to the station. Then before the kindly judge Duffy, it took some convincing to send Nellie to Bellevue Hospital for examination. At Bellevue, Nellie easily convinced the doctors she was positively demented and beyond help. After a short examination by a couple of what then passed for expert doctors, she was soon sent off to the asylum. In her 10 days in the asylum, she uncovered a litany of horrors and mistreatment. First, there was that ubiquitous chill Although the asylum was freezing cold, she references this several times, including talk on seeing others' skin going blue with the cold. The staff refused to turn on the heat or provide sufficient clothing to keep inmates warm. Second, the long hours of sitting around in the main room, unadorned and overcrowded, on backless benches, six people regularly crammed into five spaces, one dare not speak or move around for fear of abuse from the staff. Third, the food sounded absolutely Dickensian. Bly describes on her arrival to the island the sickening stench coming from one particular building. 
We passed one low building and the stench was so horrible that I was compelled to hold my breath. This turned out to be the kitchen. Bly goes on, stating she smiled at the signboard at the end of the walk. Visitors are not allowed on this road. I don't think the sign would be necessary if they tried the road, especially on a warm day. She goes on to describe inedible food, which was little more than water, blackened, possibly mouldy bread, and rancid butter. The inmates were, also, not bathed enough, and when they were, they were bathed in ice-cold water, and then were scrubbed by the same few flannels and were dried off with the same few towels. This included inmates with untreated sores. The inmates were also dressed in the same clothes for up to a month at a time. Adding to their horrors, sleep of any decent length of time was out of the question. The noise of the nurses moving up and down the hallways at night reverberated like they were in an echo chamber. If that didn't wake you, then the nurses opening the door to look in having to turn a heavy, noisy lock each time to do so, well, that was bound to wake you up. And speaking of those doors, they were death traps. If a fire were to break out, all were individually locked. With no safety to unlock all the rooms at once, should an emergency occur, there would be no chance of getting anybody out alive if the worst happened. The Bly comments that, in her opinion, many of the women incarcerated are as sane as herself, while one might choose to accept or dismiss that as they see fit. But certainly in some conversations it seems clear some of the inmates were suffering from, at the very most, depression or anxiety. Some you do question if they were suffering from anything, besides the effect of being trapped in an asylum. Bly mentions a French inmate, Josephine Desperu, who appeared to have been locked up over a misunderstanding and who did not have enough English to defend herself. Then there was a Sarah Fishbaum, who was locked away by her husband after she had either flirted with or had an affair with another man. She mentions a German maid named Margaret, who was locked up after getting into a fight with co-workers who deliberately messed up a floor she had spent hours scrubbing. What's also pretty obvious is both the unprofessionalism of the doctors. One gossiping with the nurse in front of Bly, asking if she'd read the newspaper articles on Bly's case. And in their general disinterest in helping or even properly assessing the inmates. The nurses were disturbing in other ways. Bly reporting on their propensity to act violently towards the inmates. She mentions one case where an insane woman was dropped off to the island and the nurses greeted her with a beating. When a doctor noticed the inmate's black eye, the nurses claimed the beating must have happened before the inmate arrived. Then there was the case of Mrs. Cotter. To quote Bly, one of the patients, Mrs. Cotter, a pretty, delicate woman, one day thought she saw her husband coming up for walk. She left the line in which she was marching and ran to meet him. For this act, she was sent to the retreat. She afterwards said, The remembrance of that is enough to make me mad. For crying, the nurses beat me with a broom handle and jumped on me, injuring me internally, so that I shall never get over it. And then they tied my hands and feet and throwing a sheet over my head, twisted it tightly around my throat so that I could not scream, and thus put me in a bathtub filled with cold water. They held me under until I gave up every hope and became senseless. After 10 days, Bly was rescued by her colleagues at the New York World. She recorded her experiences of Blackwell Island in a six-part expose, which was then compiled into a book. 10 days in a madhouse. The uproar over the treatment of the inmates led to a grand jury investigation, which in turn led to an overhaul of the asylum. Bly would go on to write several similar exposés in her career, taking down sweatshops, corruption in jails, and bribery from lobbyists. 
Though perhaps today she is best known for having taken on the challenge of following in the footsteps of Jules Verne's Phileas Fogg around the world in 80 days. She documented her circumnavigation of the globe in just 72 days. Nellie Bly retired from journalism in 1895 after marrying the wealthy industrialist Robert Seaman. When Seaman died in 1903, she took the reins of his factory, but would return to journalism in 1920. Elizabeth Cochran, better known to the world as Nellie Bly, star investigative reporter, died of pneumonia January 27, 1922.